salesman. I mean, after that, it's only going to be a disappointment, isn't it? Um, okay, so as you heard, I'm Jean Abbott. I've been London's uh, Green MEP for 20 years. Um, we'll be finishing this year, Brexit or not, um, and we'll, we'll see see what happens uh, there. Within the European Parliament, I'm on um, two committees, and I do actually go to committee meetings, unlike one or two other MEPs. Um, that, and I'm on the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, and I'm also on the Civil Liberties Committee. And on the Civil Liberties Committee, over the years, I've done a lot of work on the European Union's common asylum system, and also quite a bit of work on the, um, the sort of um, the migration uh, legislation that's there, sometimes from the employment side, sometimes from the civil liberties side. And there is, interestingly, a difference there, where the employment side is much more about, oh, we need people to come and work in the European Union, how do we get them? Whereas the civil liberties side, uh, despite the name of the committee, tends to be more, um, why do we want these people and how do we choose? So it's a different sort of, a bit of a different mentality almost between those two things and I think that's part of the, uh, the problem that we have, not least in the UK where everything tends to be seen through the, the eyes of the Home Office and in particular the, the Home Secretary or as she's now called the Prime Minister. So there's um, that sort of uh, element to it within the sort of the, the European dimension, as I say, I think the UK side of it as well. And interestingly, in terms of sort of where this sits in public sort of concern, there was a time when it wasn't a big issue for the public. And that generally, you know, people's attitudes on immigration were pretty, pretty soft um, and tend to be formed much more by um, political leadership. And I think for the UK, the, um, some of the political leadership that we've had over the years is what sort of pushed this up the agenda. And of course, the way in which it got used um, by the UK Independence Party in particular, but not only them, towards the referendum uh, in terms not only of free movement, but of course also hitting the time when we were seeing a significant number of people forced out of Syria uh, because of the conflict there and the way in which that then played in as well to, to the referendum. So it's, and for the UK over the years, it's tended to be more of an issue growing in the UK than in a lot of other EU member states. And part of that, I think, is the way in which it was being framed here, not least um, for those who are old enough to remember, and I'm always acutely aware in a university setting that many are not, unlike me, um, it, it, you know, that when you had William Hague, a sort of uh, Tory party leader, a lot of his rhetoric at that time wasn't so much around immigration but about asylum and all these bogus asylum seekers that were coming here and that we had to get rid of and we had to deport because, you know, the UK was such a soft touch. Um, anybody trying to deal with the UK benefits system, I don't think, would think it was a soft touch in any way. But for the Greens in the European Parliament and also the, the Greens here, I think we've gradually, you know, the, the way in which we've been trying to look at questions around sort of movement of people is firstly to remind ourselves that this is not something new. Um, you know, for those who, who you know, affiliate with particular religions, for example, you, you know, you almost start with the sort of the book with the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. So there you are, there's a forced expulsion. Um, you have the story of the, the prodigal son, you, you know, the, the one who stays at home and helps keep the, the family sort of farm, as it were, going while the brother takes his inheritance, goes off, falls in with bad crowd, loses the money, comes back and is sort of welcomed with open arms. But you know, he went off to sort of experience new things of you know fortune, etc. So make his fortune, and that turns up in a lot of you know fairy tales, folk tales, doesn't it? You, you know, the sort of the ones who stay at home and the ones who have to go off into the world to make their fortune. So it's not as if migration is something that's sort of new and is only just happening. 
Um, it's something which has been around, you know, it's part of our, our whole sort of history and development as, as humankind. And that even now, it's, it's a global phenomenon. And I think a lot of the debate that we have, whether it's in the UK or the European side of it, sees it very much as directed as either everybody is coming to the European Union or they're coming to a particular country in the European Union. Um, and every country tends to think it's their country. Um, you, or everybody's, of course, um, it, it's the UK, which is the focus. And for some people, it will be. It will be partly because of our own colonial history. It will be because, you know, I remember being sort of in, in Calais at the, the Sangat Centre was sort of years back. And, you know, asking people where is it they wanted to go. And on the map of the world, the UK was sort of almost rubbed out because so many fingers had pointed to this is, this is where we want to go. And my work colleague said, well, what about Wales? Well, of course, Wales. We're going to England. Um, you, you know, so we had to tell them it's sort of connected. Um, but, you, you know, this sort of... And a lot of that had been not least because of the World Service, the BBC World Service. And this is what people had heard, um, you, you know, what they were familiar with. So this was why, for, for many of them, um, the UK and England in particular had become this, this focus. And it was a focus of hope, um, very much about, you know, this is somewhere that respects human rights, this is somewhere where, you know, we can have a chance to work or maybe a chance to be educated, this is somewhere where we can, we can do something with our lives and then, you, you know, this will help our families was very much the, you know, what we were hearing, particularly at that time, um, young people, particularly young men from Afghanistan, and of course, that's still a lot of people who are coming, and you know, when you look at the situation in Afghanistan, it's not such a surprise. So, migration, as I say, is something which has been going on forever. Um, not everybody moves. The overwhelming majority of people move. It's only about 3% of the world's population. And the numbers look bigger, but that's because the world's population is bigger. And that out of those, the overwhelming majority of people who are moving are basically moving for work purposes. Um, and it's quite often, you, you know, it's part of what's sometimes called the, you, you know, this desire that you go to earn, learn, or yearn. You know, there's something else out there. Or things that you want to do to um, learn at whatever stage in your, your life you might be or because you think you've got a chance of a better income. And that in terms of sort of those who, who are forcibly displaced in the world, it's estimated now that the number is the biggest that it's ever been, approximately 65 million, but out of those 40 million are internally displaced. So it's not cross-border. And uh, you know, even of the refugee population, a number of those, a significant number, maybe about 20%, are still Palestinians who will have been out of you know, their homeland for a very, very long time in many cases. But it's true that the numbers are starting to rise in terms of those seeking asylum and those displaced for whatever reason. Um, you know, whether that's uh, conflict, whether it's oppression, whether it's um, disasters, whether it's um, you, you know, environmental, sort of increasingly environmental issues. And of course, one of the things that as Greens we are very concerned about is the interplay between climate change and population movement. People, the evidence at the moment is that the majority of that will still be within borders, within people's own countries internally displaced. But you are seeing um, this interplay between climate change, which exacerbates so many of the other things which can make people unstable in an area, whether it's um, you know, part of the conflict in central Nigeria, whether it's um, you, you know, sort of the, the rising floodwaters or whatever in, in Bangladesh, all these sorts of things which climate change you, you know, sort of <coughs> emphasizes, exacerbates, um, and makes so much worse than might otherwise have been. And of course, it's a huge governance issue. How do you manage um, natural disasters combined with man-made disasters? How do you manage um, 
populations where there may already be tensions and conflict? Um, how do you manage if you're a government that's pocketing the oil revenues? Um, you, you know, how do you then manage when climate change really begins to sort of put additional pressures on your, your country? So this question of good governance, I think, is, is a growing issue for, for us. Um, and it's something that certainly as Greens we've, we've really tried to raise a lot within the debate around migration just so that to make, to, to have more of an influence within that and I think we're seeing now um, that over the years where you've been looking at how policy on climate change has been developing you're now beginning to see more um, linkage in a formal sense with environmental issues and climate change in particular um, through the, the, sort of the, the expert committee that's there with the loss and damage part of the, um, you, you know, the international climate um, setup. So you've now got that, it's there also within the global compact um, for migration which was being discussed in December last year. Um, you might say a bit more about that in a moment. But in terms of, you know, for, for us as a, as a party, our view has always been that if people are going to leave their home, if they are going to, um, if they're going to move across borders, particularly that this should be something which is a matter of choice, it shouldn't be something that's forced on people because they can't afford to eat, because they can't earn a living, because of oppression, because of... Um, conflict, you know, so therefore a lot of the attention that we would have been paying within this whole sort of debate is about if people are going to make that as a genuine choice rather than a force of circumstance, what do we also then do about investing in peace building, what do we do about the in inequities in international trade, um, the economic situation within particular countries all of those sorts of issues are part of it. And again, that we're seeing that coming onto the agenda now more, usually described as the root causes of migration, as if um, migration is always forced. You know? And this is a, a particular mindset that when you hear people talk about it, and you, know, you sometimes sort of catch yourself almost falling into that, of, you know, this sort of, well, people shouldn't really be doing it, should they? And actually, you, you know, there are a lot of very good reasons to do it. You know, why not? And I think what we've seen within um, the, the European Union side of it, we're looking at the free movement dimension, that I mean, the Greens have been very strong in supporting that. I think that's not necessarily always been the case, but it's something that we've, we've moved to because we've seen that that sort of reciprocal arrangement across all EU member states and indeed, you know, two or three other countries as well, does actually give people an opportunity to experience new things without having to make a big commitment. You know, you can sort of suck and see, as it were. You know, if you want to do an Erasmus year, if you want to go and try and work in a country that you always thought looked interesting. You can do it without feeling that this is a big step that you're making, a, a commitment. Whereas I think if you're looking at working in a country which has a, you know, more of a, a formal immigration structure as the UK has for non-EU nationals, of course, you know, when you look at the form filling, um, all the requirements about good conduct, what it costs you, to do the forms, what it costs your employer if you're going to work. Um, are you going to be tied to that employer for you know the two, three years of your contract? Where's the power in this? You know, if it's your employer who chooses you, and then you are committed to working with that per that, that company, that employer, and if you stop working for them, effectively you you're supposed to leave. There's a whole different power relationship in that system to one which is the free movement one where if you're in a job that you don't like, you actually have a right to leave it without any particular sort of 
consequences in terms of all of the investment that you might have made in moving, which you're then weighing up. So it's one of those things, I think, as well, that it does, as I say, it allows you that experience just to see what's out there. And if you don't like it, you go. Or you move on. It's not just one way, is it? And the, when you look at what I think it, it does in terms of people's horizons and the way in which they feel about neighbouring countries, other cultures, it's something which tends to... I mean, not everybody has a great experience on it. I mean, you can see that in the numbers of homeless people in London who maybe, you know, have come from other EU member states and who don't have a right necessarily to housing benefit until they've been here and paying in for quite some time. Particularly when you've got a government that also takes homelessness as a reason to deport them, which the British government was trying to do for a while. But, you know, at least for many people, it is a positive experience. And there are safety nets that go with it. Unlike, you know, um, say if you're from Nepal, that you're going to work in the Gulf, chances are that you know, you're building the World Cup Stadium, your employer uh, or the person who recruited you will have your passport, and basically they have your life because they have your papers. So it's a different, it's a different system. And we're at the moment faced, of course, with the um, government changing the UK system because of our departure from the European Union discuss that later for those that wish to. And therefore there are a lot of questions coming up about the, the sort of what the new system is going to look like. And unfortunately the system for EU nationals is going to now going to look as bad as it does for third country nationals, people from outside the European Union with who who would come to work here. Um, and we've always argued as Greens that we ought to look more at levelling up than levelling down. Um, which is not to say that we're a total free movement party. I think, you, you know, that that's the direction of travel, but there's a whole set of things that need to go on in terms of equalisation, I think, of, of, of economies and so on to make that more of a, a, a reality. Um, and there's also the question at the moment about how it interplays as well with an asylum system. But we've got this situation now where the government has put its immigration bill on the table. There's a one-year consultation on the earnings threshold um, and whether you know, it makes sense to say, well, you can only come in as a qualified worker, a highly qualified worker, if you're earning 30000 a year. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then the health service says, uh, <laughs> sorry, but most of our nurses aren't earning that. Um, you, you know, care sector says most of our care workers are not earning anything like that. Well, they should be earning what they're earning. I mean, you know, we do support a living wage, a real living wage, not a government living wage. Um, you, you know, you've now got a lot of the manufacturers saying, look, a lot of our people aren't earning that, certainly at ent entry level, or sort of, you, you know. So are we actually seeing this earnings threshold being used as a way of keeping people out rather than actually encouraging people that you you feel a necessary to your economy to come in. There are going to be all sorts of questions. I mean, we would argue for no earnings threshold. Um, we've seen the way that it works and the way it works to keep families split as well. Um, where under the current system, it's only the person based in the UK you know, who wants to bring in their partner from elsewhere whose earnings count, not the earning capacity of their partner. So, you know, you get some really weird and brutal decisions on, on that basis. So, what, what are going to be the rules on family? What are going to be the rules on people who are not working in jobs that require qualifications, which is not to say that people aren't qualified, where the government is saying, oh, well, come for a year, um, you know, you have no right to change your visa. You have no right to settlement. You come for a year, and then you have to go for a year, 
So, you know, you can come and pick our potatoes for a year, and then you have to go off and pick somebody else's potatoes, presumably, then you can come back and do ours again, rather than actually giving people a right to settle, or a right to bring their family, or to, you know, move in that sense at all. And for us, I think one of the things that's been important to us, if, if you're having a system like that, how do people change their status? How do people stay on the right side of the law? We've supported an amnesty, um, indeed a regularisation system, for people who've been here, current policy is five years, um, in an irregular situation. Because many of them are settled, they have kids, they have kids who are at school, who then find that, ah, oh, you want to go to university? Um, got a passport, no passport? Where are you from? Who are you? Um, all of these, you know, so families that sort of live in the shadows almost, really worried about a knock on the door for the immigration services who have no way to regularise their status and no way to do it for their kids. And so for us, that's really important that people have that, that path. So we want to, you know, make this something which is, um, when we were having discussions uh, recently, I've seen a lot more of um, government civil servants since the referendum than I ever did before. Uh, and you've got people from the Home Office who are coming to talk to us about settled status for EU nationals. And one of them who said, well, this is when Amber Rudd was Home Secretary. Um, you know, well, what we want to do is we want to change the culture in the Home Office to a culture where we're looking for reasons to say yes to people um, who are looking for settled status, who want to stay in the UK. And she had the grace to look a bit shamefaced about this. So we said, um, have you not thought about changing the culture in the Home Office for anybody, then he's asking, that you're looking for reasons to say yes, rather than reasons to say no. Um, you know, yes, you're a civil servant, a top-ranking civil servant coming from um, a department, you know, international development conference, as was, I was reading the papers today, uh, but we've refused your visa. I know it's a government invitation to a different conference, and you're a partner, but no, you don't earn enough and we think you're going to stay. So it would be really nice if we were looking at how we have a system that's fit for purpose, that doesn't work on the basis of your race, your nationality, your earnings, but actually looks at why is it that you want to be in the UK? How can we actually say yes to that in a way that doesn't create a hostile environment, that doesn't make people feel like dirt um, when they've been to sort of have an interview about their visas, and which actually recognises this is an international you know, issue for migration, and that the British actually leave the UK to work abroad or to live abroad as well, um, you know, and that therefore what we want for ourselves we should also be offering to others. <laughs>